Okay, everyone, a very warm good evening. Since the recording has started, I wanted to just say hi once again for the recording purpose. And today's topic, we have uh, the different choice of lenses for wildlife photography and how to choose a particular lens. Then we'll talk about printing and then everything about autofocus, be it in DSLR or for mirrorless, what to do. Then we will touch upon the high key and low key and then even the handled uh, technique for low light photography. These things we will talk upon. And on top of that, a lot of you have sent in queries directly in the chat of uh, the group, SSP app group. So that also I will take it up. So the first topic is the choice of lens for wildlife. Now, let me share. Okay, now, when you talk about the lenses for wildlife photography, the first thing, let me share my screen. Okay. So I don't know how many of you have visited this particular link on my website. Uh, best camera and lens to buy. So if you click on this in my website, so this is going to take you to this database of latest camera lenses what i have prepared and if you go into the of course i need to add uh, probably the latest sony alpha 74 i need to add that otherwise all the latest cameras are here in, for all the mirrorless canon nikon everyone except for sony the latest one if you go into the lenses so you have all these various brands and then you have the cost also so right from 10,000 rupees to 15 lakh per budget i have kept so here, if you just select wildlife photography, it is going to shortlist all the various lenses available for wildlife photography. Of course, uh, in this, if you want, you can check the various ratings for each of the lenses for wildlife photography and even other genres I have put and switch it off. Now, one of the key things when we talk about uh, wildlife photography lenses is the quality of the image what you get from the lens so that one is very very important that's the primary thing what you need to check for and also i believe a lot of you have already received the uh, let me see if i have it on my desktop here yes so this photography learning path document what i've shared with all of you this one is a very, very important document and I seriously request all of you to go through this in detail, not the document, but the content of the document, the courses basically. You have to go through that in detail. Now, if you look at the very first one, camera and lens buying guide. So in that particular chapter, let me also open that. So what I'll be doing is, uh, oops. So the website, then the best camera and lens to buy. Then go fix website. And then so all the courses I will open it here. So in this, okay, camera and lens buying guide. So if you go into the camera and lens buying guide. So in this, okay, stop talking. Yes. Okay, so if you come down into this one in the lens type, there is this lens MTF characteristics. Okay, so here I've explained the key features of the lens, other things, but the lens MTF characteristics, that is an important one. So that is one chapter, what I would recommend you to go through. Basically like here, you select whatever lens you want for wildlife photography, and then here, any of the lenses, you just click on the lens, it is going to help you view the MTF chart. Of course, as I said, first, you need to go through that particular course to understand what is an MTF chart, how to understand the MTF chart. So in simple terms, MTF chart helps you understand the sharpness and the resolution. So resolution, sharpness, the contrast. So how exactly the lens performs. So that is what the MTF chart is going to help you understand and for every lens i have put the mtf chart here so my recommendation for you is like how to arrive at the best lens for photography forget about wildlife any genre of photography like how to arrive at the best lens 
you have to first go into this course, understand the MTF uh, chart, so the lens MTF characteristics. So this particular course, I want you all to go through it. Pause it. So, and then come back here once you understand that, come back here and then based on your budget, of course you can shrink the budget saying like, okay, probably like from 10,000 to say, to two lakhs, two and a half lakhs. If you choose that budget, that is going to like shortlist you all the brands, Canon, Sony, Nikon. So within that, again, you can shortlist, click on Sony, it's going to give you only the Sony lenses, okay? So this is how uh, you can shortlist whatever lens you want, not only for wildlife, as I said, any genre of photography. So obviously cost is going to be a factor. So you need to check the cost and then the MTF characteristics. So those two hand in hand, it has to go understand how exactly how sharp the lens is based on that, you will have to basically buy the lens, okay? So of course, what I'll be doing is like, I will not be explaining everything what is already explained in the course. So a lot of the questions which have come in, what I'm going to do is I'll try to answer as much as possible to that. But of course, give you a pointer because in this session, if I start explaining what if an MTF chart, how to read it, then I'm going to end up taking up all the time of the session. I have already recorded that course over there. So I'm going to show you the pointers where the information is there for you to go ahead further do your own reading and then understand come back and further review and uh, go through whatever lens you want okay so that said like anything specific to lens buying whatever queries any of you have feel free to like ask me in the chat and i'll be happy to answer it now so the way we're going to drive the session is uh, as i said like i'll talk about a particular question a particular topic and related to that topic, you're welcome to ask the questions here. Okay, yes, Janisha, you can go ahead and ask the questions here in the chat box. So Abhinav, what about third party lenses, Tamron Sigma? Uh, even, I think even though here, I may not have put the brand here, the Sony, Canon, Nikon mounts are available. So if I just go down somewhere here, say for example, if I choose say, uh, if I choose all the three brands, here you will even see the Tamron Sigma, those lenses also you will see here. I don't know where it is. Yeah, there you go. So there is the Tamron 150, 600 is here. Even the Sigma also probably is somewhere. Yeah, Tamron once, that must be Sigma. So 150, 600 Tam, Tamron is here. Which was the other one of it? So SP, okay, this is the Canon mount, sorry. So this is the Canon mount that was probably the Nikon mount. And uh, probably Sigma must be somewhere here. If I'm not included Sigma, then the chances are I would prefer the Tamron over the Sigma and that's why probably I've not included the Sigma, but if it's not there, I'll try to include it, okay? Uh, Janisha, yes, as I said, uh, uh, here in this, like let's uh, ask questions related to the topic I'm talking and at the end, I want to take up all the generic questions, okay? And also let me quickly give the answer, setting for Sony A1, uh, just refer the Sony A9, manual the sony a92 course what i have so that is same as the a1 setting it's just the menu option is different otherwise the various settings of the camera more or less 95 percent they are the same unless some new settings in a1 they have introduced so just the as i said the menu option the layout of the menu option is different but otherwise for now the a92 will do but uh, that said yes the sony canon nikons the latest menu options then the mirrorless for Canon and Nikon. So those courses are also pending, which I hope to do soon. Okay, cool. Any other questions related to the lenses? Let me know. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next topic. Recording is going on. Yes. Okay, cool. All right. Anyone, any other questions? Feel free to ask here related to the lenses. Okay. Okay, all right. Uh, of course, you can always ask the question even at a later point of time. Next one, okay, printing. So now printing obviously is, is a very, very difficult or a totally separate kind of a topic. The main reason being when we talk about printing, right? Now printing involves a lot of parameters, especially the colors. So colors is the most important part. When we talk about printing, you need to find out some of the best printers out there in different cities. Okay, because uh, printing, the issue what happens with printing is like, no matter how good you process your images, finally, like if you just give it to some printer, 
he may not have the right kind of ICC profiles, or for that matter, his his printer may not be calibrated to your computer, what you have basically processed. So that is where the mismatch is going to be. And not many printers out there or many printing folks out there understand the whole concepts of ICC profile calibration. So that is where, as I said, it's important that you catch hold of people who understands printing. Uh, so probably that is something like uh, which I can give pointer to. Uh, so printers. So printing, like I have a friend of mine in Hyderabad, Ismail, uh, he does some amazing printing. Or uh, for that matter, in Bangalore, uh, there are a lot of uh, excellent professional printers who understands about calibration, color profiles. So they, they are there, even Honeycomb is there in Bangalore and they have their online website also. When Honeycomb, uh, they're quite good with respect to the printing. Uh, so that is where the challenge is. The processing, what you all know, everything related to the processing is the same what you need for printing. Of course, there are a few changes with respect to sharpening and then the image dimension. So when you do an image resize, so that there has to be a little change, uh, especially when it comes to printing, the resolution will vary. And the sharpening, again, the radius instead of 0.3, we use 1.3. So that is the only change for printing. The rest complete process for saving the image, everything is the same. The only challenge is the actual printing. So that is where like generally, okay, I'll, I'll tell you like my process of printing what I do. So in my case, what I do is like I have the complete file, the processed file. So I take the processed file and also the processed raw file. So if you want to take the processed raw file to the printer, then make sure to copy the .xmp file. So if you're processing your file using any of the Adobe tools, be it Lightroom or for that matter, Adobe Camera Raw, uh, so you have to carry, so if the file name is 1429, uh, then the 1429.xmp, that file will get created in the same folder as where you keep the raw files. So that file along with the raw file, if you take it, and then if at the printing shop, if the person copies both the files and opens it in Photoshop, he will see your processed image. If you miss to carry the .xmp file, then everything goes back to zero you have to start from scratch at that place. So please remember to carry the .xmp file, okay? So generally what I do, so I carry my process TIFF file and then the raw file with the XMP. And then there what I do is I show that image, he opens it in the laptop and I make sure the colors, everything is as per my taste, what I have processed in my computer. So on his system, on his monitor, I check for those things. Once I'm happy with that, then I give a test print. So test print to make sure the colors what I see or rather like the colors what I want in the final output, those things it matches. So that I give a test print. Once I'm happy, say for example, if I'm printing five images, so I carry all the five images and all the five images, small thumbnails. So I don't print high resolution immediately. So a sample of a small thumbnail, like a decent size in which we can judge the colors overall. So that kind of a sample image I print look at it and once i'm happy then i tell him saying go ahead print the 20 by 30 or the 16 by 24 18 by 24 whatever dimension i've given so i asked him to go ahead and basically do it okay so that is the process i do uh, otherwise what will happen said the calibration comes into picture if you try to print on your own at home chances are you may basically let fail because you need to make sure you calibrate your printer for your basically monitor so the area we uh, there is nothing called as which is the correct one. As I said, it purely depends on the ICC profiles. So the ICC profile of the image, what you have tagged with, and then the ICC profile, what they're using for the monitor. So there, once you open, those colors has to match. So that is where the calibration process comes in. So you cannot just process on your system, just take it to somewhere else and expect that there, everything is going to be fine. That never happens because of the monitor calibration. Okay, so that is where each monitor is different and colors will appear different depending on the ICC profiles as I said. So that is where the whole calibration comes into picture. Okay, cool. Next question related to printing. Anyone? Sir, it's Manoj, sir. Yes, Manoj. Sir, uh, while in cropping, uh and sending to the printing uh, files it's uh, it will be the pixels is going sir why no that is where i said the resolution is important see you need to understand so 
as i said i already sent you personal message separately also it's important that you go through the entire processing the post processing course everyone so it's just not a message for you but for everyone out here so there's a lot of effort which has gone in in creating all the courses okay so whatever queries you have right every single of those queries are answered in some of the chapters out there so that is where i'm going to point out and tell you where you need to look at it so if you look through the post processing courses right so the very first one i talk about the resolution then the image dimensions those i talk so same thing so when you do a cropping okay so in photoshop when you do a cropping it is very important that you put the resolution when you export it it will already be at 300 dpi so let me quickly show you folks okay so let me just take a sample one uh, as to like how you basically process for post processing uh, for printing let me quickly show it to you uh, am i sharing no i'm not sharing the screen let me quickly do that Okay, so I'm just having some random, I was working on some random images. Okay, let me just take up some random image just for showing you. So I open the file in raw. Okay, so this image raw, assume that you have done all the processing, everything. The most important is you go in over here in the resolution, you click the link down, come here and here if you see it is pro photo resolution. Generally, we keep it to 72 DPI for web based, but if it is for printing, you keep the resolution as 300 DPI. Okay, so you keep the resolution 300 DPI and this one. Uh, so let me just minimize this thing. So this one again, I do a open which means from Adobe Camera Raw, I'm now taking it to Photoshop. Okay. So this is uh, from an A1, so it's a very high resolution pixel, a very high resolution image. So Manoj, to answer your question, so I click on the crop here. You see here just a minute, sir. Sir, no, just a minute. Can you hear me, sir? Oh, I, this session will be available for recording. So you can go back and please play and you can check it. Okay. Uh, but please pay attention to the steps what I'm doing. And here you don't have to write down the steps. Everything is recorded. So you don't have to worry. Okay. And these are already part of my courses. So double uh, check you will get for checking this. Okay. So I click on this here and then say, for example, if you want to make this as a 18 by 24 image or 24 by 18, make sure you enter 24 inches and then say 18 inches. Okay, and this is already at 300 dpi. So when we do the cropping, you decide. So this is the dimension. So 24 by 18 or 24 by 16, probably is a better aspect ratio inches. So this is very important. 24 inches, 16 inches. Okay. Uh, sorry, WH. This is what I missed. Sorry. So you have to take into W into H width height into resolution. So 12 inches. Oh, let me make it 12 less into eight. Otherwise processing power will be a problem for me here. Oh, sorry, this is 12 inches, eight inches resolution is 300 DPI. There you go, okay. So then you decide what kind of cropping you want to do, what kind of composition you want to do. This is how you decide the cropping and then the resolution for your print. So once you do this cropping, of course, uh, composition rules, all those things you follow, please. Click it. Okay. And this is going to be the resolution. So if you go and check the image size, go into the inches. So this is a 12 by 8. 12 by 8 is your A4 size. Okay, so this is how you decide about what width, what dimension you need, how to crop for the crop your image. So here, like if you do heavy cropping or you're already at 72 DPI and you try to do a close crop, especially like uh, extreme close crop you want to do, then it will get pixelated. You cannot use it for your printing. So that again is very important. 
as I keep saying, especially for printing, do not do a close crop. At least retain anywhere from 15 to 20 megapixel size of the image. You maintain that, uh, that will be good. And of course, once you finish the overall processing, make sure to save the file as a TIFF file for printing. So instead of JPEG, uh, TIFF is better, but JPEG will definitely work. Nothing wrong, especially for the, uh, I mean, see, at the end of the day, it also depends what is the purpose of printing. Especially if you're doing printing for some exhibition, then it has to be really high quality print, which means you need to go for a 16-bit TIFF, take that to the printer, get it printed, properly on the canvas or depending on the good paper, what they have. Okay. So that again is important. So DPS dots per inch, it says about the density of the pixels. So that is the one density of the pixels is say 300 DPI, we say dots per inch, or uh, if you talk in terms of digital, it is PPI pixels per inch, because the whole dot is related to printing and pixels is related to the digital image. So that is where generally the PPI and the DPI we sort of interchange it. So okay. Ah, uh, yes, go ahead. So once you export the file as stiff, suppose if you do it at JPEG and later on after a couple of years, you want to go back and uh, print an image of that, so that the one that you edited. Mm -hmm. but, uh, you, do, you do not save the raw file or you do not save the XMP file. So okay. you need to go back to the raw and then do the edit and then do the yes. DIL, right? So but for me, is there a See, uh, in my case, the processed raw, that is the original file. I do not uh, try to retain the JPEGs or any of that. So for me, the master file is say this raw file, what is there? So this, if I properly process it, everything gets retained here along with the XMP file. So I never delete the XMP file. I always retain the XMP file in that folder. Even after 10 years, so for example, a lot of my images, which I processed way back in 2013, 2014, all of them, it still has the XMP file in that specific folder. So if I had to print any of my old images, I just go to the trough file, everything is processed, I export it, whatever dimension the requirement is for a calendar or whatever the output is, I just resize or crop it as per that, minor corrections, save it, it's ready for print. So for me, the original, original file is the raw file. If you don't mind, can you also show where do you look the XMP file? And yeah, so for example, now any folder, say so, uh, here, all my files are here itself. Uh, still, I'm sharing my desktop. Yes, so photograph, I go into wildlife, say 2021, if I go, uh, soon A1 to Bharatpur. So Bharatpur, if I go into A1 shortlisted files, go in, you see here, every whatever files I've already processed, that has the corresponding XMP file here. So those files which doesn't have an XMP, those files have not even opened or seen in uh, Adobe Camera Raw. Because like I keep looking in the bridge and those files which I like, which I feel is good, shortlisted ones, so that I process. The moment you process and say okay or done, so that is when the corresponding XMP file gets created. So wherever my raw files are, every single folder of that will have it. So a lot of it, so here I have not touched any of these raw files. So, so you export as TIFF, so I will, along with the TIFF, you have the XMP, X, X, XMP file generated? No, no, the moment, so here, if you see now, so this file now, 5611, I opened it, uh, whatever changes said, I did okay, done. The okay. moment I said done in Adobe Camera Raw, in this Kaziranga folder, Safari 3-4, whatever you see here, within that folder, that corresponding XMP file gets created. Okay, that's the camera raw feature. Okay, do you, do you have it? It's the, the uh, Photoshop, sorry, Adobe feature. So I say open this in camera raw. So I make all the various changes here, contrast, whatever I do. Either I say open or I say done. When I click on any of these buttons, the corresponding XMP file gets created. If I say cancel, everything is gone. And what about Lightroom? If I do the editing in the Lightroom? Same thing. And then save the raw as... Uh as what like tiff or JPEG? so from there no raw you, you don't uh, save the raw as tiff raw is always a raw file okay. the end result of it when you do a save as there you can decide whether you want to save it as a tiff or a jpeg there you decide so the original raw with the corrections everything is always intact that doesn't change 
but like uh, sorry i'm still continuing to do no it. problem I, I usually use lightroom for ah. the editing okay. yes i put my raw images i edit it what i use what i usually follow is i edit it i convert that to jpeg that's my biggest mistake so wait the, that I particular step where you say convert it to jpeg at that when point, i save as can be file is export the file right when i say yes. when i do the editing when i click on export the file yes so when i export the file you have options like uh, which uh, uh, what format do you have to save it as jpeg tiff or any of those right so there i somehow do jpeg but only okay. if i want to print something thinking that okay this might be a printable image i do a tiff but uh, okay. where do i see the xml uh, format as from like no no see xml is a photoshop XMP, related file so okay. that uh, xmp sorry xmp file okay so for example if i open this folder um let me go to any folder again even short list so if i double click on this xmp file okay so it started you can open this in the dot txt hold on let me say open with okay i get it so photoshop whatever you export it you will get xmp file exactly so anything you do lightroom if i if lightroom the lightroom. moment you start making changes when you go into the develop and start making changes to that particular file the corresponding xmp is already created so wherever you stored the raw files go into that particular folder you will start seeing this corresponding xmp files so the reason is these are sony files or canon files or nikon files and adobe doesn't have permission to write back into those files right. okay it's, it's a read only file for adobe whereas if you use a canon dpp on canon file or a nikon capture nxd on a nikon file okay so whatever corrections you do that gets returned back into the same original raw file so there you will not see this kind of xmp files so xmp file is generated by adobe with all those changes so all those changes are intact in the xmp file okay all right thank you i got it okay yeah. so you you don't have to do anything with the xmp file but yes so if you want to take the processed raw file to the printer person that raw file and the xmp file both copied together in the same folder take it and there if you open it the corresponding file xmp file it will read and then apply all those various changes got it i have a stupid question to you, but can we convert a jpeg to tiff no jpeg to tiff you can easily convert but you will not retain those uh, resolution and the clarity you will not receive see at the end of the day you have a jpeg file or the file what you have that one when you do a file save as you can save it as whatever you want say in case of photoshop so consider this is a, a jpeg file which i have opened you click on file save as Okay, so you will get all these options here. You can save any okay. file to any format. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have a question. If, uh, if uh, Anitya, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, in my case, I do certain processing also in Photoshop after doing doing it in Lightroom. So okay. uh, at the end, uh, I have a PSD or PSP file depending upon that. So okay. I can directly take that PSD file to the printer and uh, so course, in that uh, case, I don't need XMP file. No, not required. See, uh, as long as the printer guy is knowledgeable. So when you take a PSD file, he knows that means a PSD file will have different layers what you have created. Yes. If yes, that person yes. is knowledgeable, then like he knows like how to handle that file finally, how to flatten the layers, send it for print. So he, if he's knowledgeable, he will know all those various things. And also a lot of printers, they do all this processing in layers itself so that like when they make a correction yes. when they know like it's not good they can just go ahead and delete that layer and again start over okay okay so in that case i don't need xmp i can directly take the psd and okay that was my, thank you thank so you. the xmp and the raw why, why i said that is like say you take a processed tiff file and once you take it there you figure out that the colors are not good the way you want it and you want to start from scratch immediately say if it's a matter of just two or three files you want to start from scratch if you don't have the raw file then you can't you can't try to recorrect the uh, uh this one the tiff file what you have or even for that matter psd if you have heavily processed your psd file there you see and everything the colors everything is wrong this is not what you want so you need a base file to start from from scratch okay Especially yeah, I've seen the, uh, 
the the i have seen my image is getting darkened a lot that was um, this is the case yes that and i actually i was actually told by the exhibition guy that uh, um, uh, give it in adobe rgb icc so i supplied them and later on found that they have pro they do not they didn't change the printer settings but i was told to give it in adobe rgb later on i found out so i think that was one of the biggest mismatch of that because i generally process and export it in srgb but i think for SRGB, that change uh, srgb is good for online so for yes. uh, any online posting srgb is good but for serious printing you need to have adobe rgb uh, nowadays there are some really top quality printers which do support adobe rgb so directly adobe rgb colors you can print otherwise majority of the folks you take adobe rgb they convert it to srgb and then they print it yes i think that would have been the okay any anyway, anyway i got it i will just retest with some of the samples and then we'll be able to better figure it out well thank you sir okay thank you. sure okay uh did i miss any questions here no oh uh, yeah mano you say you have a question on printing please go ahead now before buying sony alpha one i have giving one test print sir okay. the, for ca calendar i gave him them uh, 70 300 dpa that i have given for them for the test printing calendar sir okay but they have done one mistake they get me a whatsapp uh, photos uh, to for print what are the photos i'm and they need uh, they ask for uh, samples they are uh, asking me what are the photos they give me for samples they asked uh, for proof and uh, i send them uh, my uh, personal pen drive to them also sir no, no. at last finally uh, the uh, print uh, print what i give in whatsapp only they didn't uh, pr print in uh, 300 dp they print in uh, normal paper like uh, 72 or below the 72 dpa then you are going to the wrong printer as simple as that yes sir. i said you need to choose the right printer and it comes at a cost Especially another one sir yes uh, uh, small doubt sir if, if uh, 72 dpa uh, if we process for uh, instagram or uh, anything same uh, dot uh, xmp file will be saved in a shortlist format or uh, it won't be saved sir See, XMP is associated with the raw file, not with JPEG or TIFF. So, yes, and yes. also XMP is purely when you process it using the Adobe software. Yes, sir. I have Adobe software. That's only I'm asking, sir. So, the moment you process the raw file, the corresponding uh, XMP file gets created. Thank you, sir. Okay. Oh, cool. So, yeah. Sir, I out. Can I ask? Sure, sure. Please go ahead. Anything related to printer, we can discuss. Printing. Yes, sir. So, so, so my camera doesn't support RAW. It doesn't have, it's a point and shoot. So okay. it only has JPEG. So okay. in post-processing also what I do, I keep the original and I keep the processed image also. But both are JPEG only in okay. short. So for printing, I should give the JPEG only if I want to print them. Yeah, I mean, you don't have much choice here. So whatever is the original high resolution your camera has uh, provided, so that is the one which you should use for printing, not any process, because once you process an image, then you change the resolution, then that uh, is not usable for printing. So make sure all your original files, be it JPEG, whatever your camera gives, that has to be in a separate folder and all the processed one in a different folder. Do not mix them. Yes, sir. And another thing, uh, what I experienced it, I tried processing my images on my laptop as well as my TV using a monitor. And in both of them, I used the same profile. I made sure that I'm using the same profile. Then to the colors are appearing different. No, no, no. It's not using the same profile. Uh, it's calibration comes into picture. Okay. So uh, again, as I said, uh, go through the second chapter of my post-processing. So there I have explained what is monitor calibration and how to get it done. So if you are using an external display, then that has to be separately calibrated to your uh, computer, basically. Okay. So for example, you connect, uh, you have a laptop you work on. So laptop monitor is different then the TV screen is different. So if you're going to use the TV screen, then you need to have the TV screen calibrated to your laptop. That is a separate process. So one is calibrating your display, which is your laptop screen itself. The other is the external display. So these are two different displays which means two different calibration has to be done. So depending on what you use, 
in your computer in the system you have to keep changing the profile so that is where when it comes to serious calibration serious professional use of this displays you need to use the corresponding profile which is used for calibrating that device so if you don't understand what i'm talking okay, about sir. go to the chapter 2 or the chapter yes yes sir i'll check that out so yes. sir whenever we go to the printer we have to do that calibration thing over there also no you yes. don't have to do it uh, he should have done it so the person at the printing place if he knows about printing then whatever computer is connected to the printer that display and the printer that calibration should have happened and that is a very normal step anyone who is into the printing world they do it even now at the time of printing if they change the paper so for example currently somebody is printing it on a canvas and from canvas they change it to a different quality paper and once they load that quality paper into the uh, capsule for printing so they again calibrate and make sure the display is calibrated to that quality paper okay so they do that level of calibration at the printing places or professional printers okay okay sir thank you so much nilakshi yeah. what papers are used uh, right from uh, glossy paper to matte paper to canvas to even uh, what do you call metallic paper so there are different kind of paper i mean you just visit the printing place and he will give you a list of different quality of papers what they have so printing again is a totally diff different world and you have to go sit with a professional printer and actually experience the different quality of papers what they have within canvas itself they have different again uh, uh, what do you call the the way we talk mm -hmm. about epi then the thickness of the paper also will matter so that also comes into picture okay good uh, any other queries on printing okay super let's move on let me just bring myself okay and uh, quickly let me hold on um, okay so i just muted all the participants when it comes to questions you can ask uh after printing what was the topic oh, not this okay my favorite topic about af cool so let's talk about auto focusing points and before we go into the topic of auto focusing points again i go back to the photography learning part document so here if you come down camera metering understanding focusing so this is very very important now whatever i'm going to explain to you now using an external camera connected to the computer here each of these things what i'll explain is already part of my course so the sixth chapter of understanding focusing so that you go through it in the main basics and advanced fundamentals of photography so once you finish that in wildlife in the technical aspects so there is this focusing modes to be used for wildlife so there i talk both each of the different kind of auto focusing points for canon and nikon okay so in detail i talk so to help you understand what i am talking about let's go into my courses so if i go into the wildlife photography course okay you are not sharing a screen oh i'm sorry hold on thanks for that uh zoom with my screen okay so this is the wildlife course so in this wildlife course you come down signature shots uh shooting techniques technical aspects of wildlife photography in this you come down all the way focusing modes to be used for wildlife photography so this one understanding auto focusing points in canon understanding auto focusing points in nikon sony so of course this nikon and sony i put because at that point of time i was still not using sony i did not have access to sony but more or less nikon and sony they are correlated the kind of auto focusing points but you don't have to worry now so the 13th one is for canon 14th one is for nikon in depth i have explained to you each of the different kind of auto focusing points so if i just go into the canon part so again this is purely for dslr uh, mirrorless it is still not it was still not available at that point okay 
if I just do a fast forward, of course, the volume is muted here. Not it. I, I talk a lot in my courses, I believe. <laughs> So here, uh, so this particular chapter, so I click on the AF button and the various different autofocusing points. So this is the Canon 1DX Mark II. So the various autofocusing points, each one of them, what they do and when to use that. So that I've explained and the same explanation I've repeated for Nikon as well. Okay. So I don't know what I'm talking about here at this point. So auto-focusing points. And of course, as I said, the composition aspects. So the very first one. Yeah, see here. The very first auto-focusing point is the AF point selection. If you go into that, the first one is the manual select, which is the... Okay. So this is important. This is about Nikon and Sony. So once you finish this, come back here. And for Sony users, go into the Sony Alpha 92. Okay, only for Sony users. In that, the seventh one is autofocus area modes. So that particular chapter there is there for Sony users. Go look at that. And once you go through that one there again, in detail, I've explained to you what each of the various autofocusing points are and when to use them. Okay. So those things are explained there in detail. But that said, let me quickly show you since we had this topic of discussion. Let me just quickly show it to you as to what exactly they do. Uh, so I'm going to switch the screen now. Okay, so I have my camera connected. And uh, I'm going to switch the video. Sorry. Okay, uh, so I'll switch the video. So this is the display what you're seeing from my Sony Alpha one. Okay, and I have a 24105. So this is my currently my room. So here, so I just have the 200-600 and then uh, the AC remote I just kept over there. Okay, so if I have to help you understand, my audio is coming through, right? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, audio video is separate. Audio should be fine. Let me minimize. Yes, sir. Yeah, so let me minimize the chat one. Okay, so this is good. Now, if I go into the different uh, focusing points uh, for this. Okay, so this is better. So these are all the different kind of focusing points what you have beat for Canon, uh, beat Canon, Nikon, Sony for all of them. Okay, so let me just close it now. So the first one is the wide what you see. Now, the concept of wide, be it for Sony, Nikon, Canon, okay, for everyone, it is the same. So, in case of wide, what happens if I switch to wide, as you can see here, I don't have any control as to where the camera is going to focus. Okay, so the concept of autofocus still remains the same, where there's bright light and then the contrast is high, camera is going to focus. If you see here, none of those black areas, wherever there is black subject, black area of the subject, camera is not going to focus over there. Let me try to zoom in a little. Okay, so even if I zoom in, wherever there is those white things, you see that is where the camera focuses. Let me just go up like this. Okay, so still that border area, the contrast is high, that is why it is focusing at there. So if you want to focus on the dial of the camera in all the in complete all zone, full zone, I don't think I'll have that control. See here, I want to focus on the dial, the right side dial, what you see, I want to focus there, but no, it jumps everywhere. So this is the problem when you use the wide. That means the camera chooses wherever there is bright light, good contrast, the camera chooses. Okay. So that is definitely not a great option to use. Of course, that is a good option to use in case of the background is non-distracting, just the subject is there especially birds in flight, that would be a good one to use. The camera will focus just on the subject available over there. So the next one is the zone. Again, the zone is the same as now 
what i'll do is like quickly all these are already explained in my courses but still for the benefit of all of you let me quickly take you through it now the zone is the same as in uh, the canon dslrs you have uh, the flexible area uh, the zone af zone af uh, is already there in the autofocusing points okay so it's the same one and also in case of nikon if i have to correlate the zone concept is more to do with the d15 d56 or d24 so the dynamic area you have the dynamic area for focusing that is something similar to the zone where an area of your image basically is used for focusing so if i keep it to zone in case of sony let me just focus it to the wall there you see here you see those uh, four uh, squares the borderline so whatever comes within that the camera is going to focus so it's a subversion of the all zone again if you see here again i don't have control okay so this is again an uh, uh, af area mode which generally i do not use i don't use the all zone or uh, the first one which is wide or the zone i don't use it okay the next one is the center fix in case of sony and uh, whereas the canon nikon they don't have this concept of center fix so they have the next one so center fix is like whatever is there in the center of the frame the camera just focuses there now if i want to focus on the dial i just get the center focusing point on that that's it okay so if from a composition it is down then if i need to focus on the dial if i have to move the focusing point it will not move okay because it is fixed at the center that is what it means again this is not a af point which i use the other one is the spot single okay so if you see it has small medium and large so three different options we have so small is generally what i use so in this case if you want you can move the focusing point wherever you want you want it on the dial that will be in focus okay so you want to come down you want to focus to that handle gimbal what i have on this side that will get focused so this is how you can move around the focusing point the single one again this is the same which is there in canon and nikon which is the spot af the single point focusing point which is there that is the one for canon and nikon the next one again is basically the expand spot so the expand spot of sony is the same as the grp the group of uh, nikon or the expand area af something like that is there in uh, canon i'm forgetting the terminologies so here the concept is like if you see again let me just keep it in this open area yeah so here if you see the meaning of this is the center auto focusing point is there so along with that if i try to focus see here the corresponding extra af points you see so those are the assist af points so they will not be actively used for auto focusing but they will assist the main center auto focusing point to achieve focus okay so that is what this one is again this is a point which i generally do not use in for my kind of shooting the the main one which i always use is this the tracking one so tracking this is an absolutely a gem of a focusing point again if you see in sony this is the major major point which is missing in canon r5 r6 okay uh, that is one of the reasons why i am not fully happy with the canon r5 r6 because this control i do not have so if you see the uh, in fact like nikon i have not used so nikon i cannot comment probably like i plan to like get uh, z6 z5 any of those or z6 z7 one of those very soon and i want to explore uh, what kind of focusing what kind of tracking options are there so i really really am eager to explore the nikon i'll be doing that very soon along with the course as well now the problem with canon is they have just one single option for tracking okay and that again as both for bird and mammal or animal or even human everything is built into just one uh, focusing point option which says you cannot change say in case of sony let me just take it to the wall so that all the parameters are properly seen so if you see here from a tracking point of view currently it is in small medium large and within that you have that expand and then other way if i come you have the center 
you have the zone and then you have the all the wide one so all the various auto focusing points what you saw on top that is there for the tracking in sony and this is majorly majorly missing in case of uh, canon okay so canon has something probably a large one like this okay if you see the size of the square that is quite large whereas in terms of canon in canon it is still very very large so generally the way i use this is uh, hold on i generally use the small okay so the concept of using for all the sony users out here and the same applies to the any of the mirrorless folks when you use the tracking option so the funda is you see this white square okay so you need to get the white square on the point where you want to focus say for example if this is where i want to focus i get the square on that and then i press the focusing point or rather the focusing button then if you see no matter where and how i move i missed it okay so where i move the camera is going to stay locked to that particular area so this is an extremely extremely useful one so i release the focusing uh, button take it back and get it on it and then i press it so this is the way i generally use this option so no matter what i want to focus on i get the twice square white square on that and then i hit the focusing button so this is how you basically start tracking that subject doesn't matter where you move the camera up down it will stay locked to that area again release it somewhere else you want to focus go there hit on that then the camera will start focusing there it will continue to track that so this is the main concept of tracking and uh, this is something in case of uh, canon so the size of this particular square is quite large so between leaves so between two branches you want to focus at a subject at the back so canon r5 r6 it fails over there i tried doing it it doesn't penetrate through small areas so for example you see this between this and this you see the small gap of opening if your subject is somewhere at the back so in case of sony i can change the size of this focusing point from say if it is large you see here it covers both of this so it will be difficult for me to focus through that small area that is a problem in canon i cannot change the size of this so here if i click you see it goes on the left or probably on the right but if i want to focus between that in a small gap i will change my focusing size to small you see here now it can go through that so of course whatever is subject at the back over there i hit on that and then press the focusing point it will focus through that one so this is one major complaint i have on the canon r5 r6 where if they could fix this it's going to be amazing for them okay so these are all the different kind of auto focusing points what we have now based on the size of the subject based on what you are shooting you will have to basically choose the corresponding size of the auto focusing point and then start using it okay so there are questions which are coming let me take it up for that let me change my video okay so there are questions which are coming uh, yes uh, kalyan puranand i am recording this session it will be uh, available tracking of z62 is not good z9 is supposed to be good okay so satish uh, if the subject is moving doesn't matter uh, i am still okay i'm not sharing hold on let me just show you i hope zoom through zoom i should be able to uh, share it i'm sharing the entire screen so let me show you something what i have done is it in day four okay probably this may have it so let me show you how i work in the field okay if the subject is moving then what we asked i hope this works let me see see here any action happening i take the square on that and then the tracking happens see i just leave the focusing now the square is still white i keep moving around the camera here and there searching for the subject there you go the subject comes there then i hit again i missed it 
I keep searching. See, I don't press the focusing button here. See here, once I take this subject uh, square on the subject, then I hit the focusing button. Okay. So if the subject is moving, I'll show you like hopefully in, in case if it's not in this. Yeah, let's wait. This is a very long video. See there again, I hit on it. I have a lot of action uh, videos in this actually. Oh. See, when, when I move to a different subject, you see here, I release the focusing, I keep take moving around the white square. Once I find the subject, then hit the focusing point. I think at a later point, action will happen. Let's wait and see. Ah, there you go now. Nope. I keep searching for subjects. Okay, let's try a different video where there is action. Let's try this. Yeah. Of course, all this a proper video I'm going to make and then I'll be putting it online. And in fact, if any of you have seen my reels in that I have shared, I don't know which is that particular video I shared in reels. So there a lot of action happens, the subject flies and the tracking just follows that flawlessly. Let me do a fast forward. Okay, there you go. Okay, so watch it now. So see here, it, it caught the fish. Look at the way the tracking happens. Doesn't matter where it goes. See there, I just, all I have to do is follow the subject. The camera's autofocusing will take care of everything. You don't have to worry. That is the power of the tracking of Sony. You just need to get that square on the subject, keep it on it, and then it is done. Okay, so hope that helps. Uh, Question. In case, hello, hello. Okay, my audio is still on. Uh, so what is the max shutter speed you have in A1? I think it's one by 35,000 of a second or 40,000 of a second. I have not seen what is the maximum. Uh, let's see, I have the A1 here. Since like it's a mirrorless camera. Okay, let me go into setup priority. So one by 2500, 832. Yeah, one by 32,000 is the max shutter speed I get in my mirrorless. Okay. So I have a question on focusing. Oh, sure, please go ahead. You were just showing one of the videos where there were two birds going sad, right? So you put the spot, you put that spot on one of the bird, right? Uh, that's I right. Need to focus on the other one as well because to capture that as a. Uh, now, like see, a, wherever yeah. that white square, wherever you put it on, and then once you press the focusing button, camera will start focusing over there. It will just track that particular bird and not any other subject. Okay, so it's specific to one. It'll just one subject. Yeah, that particular subject it'll track only that. So of course, if you want both in focus, then you need to understand about the depth of field. The concept of depth, depth of field comes into picture. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Sir, it's not easy. No, currently I'm not sharing my camera at all. So currently the sharing has stopped. But uh, folks, I, I don't know whether all of you are able to see the video properly because in Zoom, when I tra transmit any videos, 100% it uh, doesn't go through properly because of the delay, the lag. Not sure if all of you are able to see the video properly. The way the tracking happens when the format was chasing it, the way it worked, uh, I don't know if all of you are able to see that. Sir, can see. It's Manoj Ji, sir. Can I ask a question, sir? Wait, wait. I'll take up uh, the question from Manish here, which has come. 
Sir, I see in Canon 90D AF manual sport AF has two squares outside the bigger area. Uh, which does uh, uh, area and inside smaller area? Which does it? Okay, uh, so that one only the center one it uh, uses because the outside one is what we call as the assist AF points. So the assist AF point doesn't have any role in basically focusing unless you are talking about the spot AF. If it is the spot AF, what you're talking, then the center small one, what we have, so the camera will achieve focus to the smaller one, not the bigger one. Okay, so hope uh, that helps Manish. And okay, yeah, Manoj, go ahead and ask, please. Sir, uh, now you've shown in spot uh, AF, sir. Correct. We can change into large uh, AF for that, or uh, we can keep in sp spot AF also, sir. No, see, the according one... to the board. One main thing, Manoj, is this different sizes of the AF area, most what I showed you, the focusing point size, right? That purely depends on the size of the subject in the frame. So there is no standard answer as to which one you should be using. If there was a standard answer, then Sony would not have given so many options. They would have given just one square, one single, use it for everything. It doesn't work like that. So that is where, so for example, in my case, what I do is I enable the bird IAF. Okay. okay, so in, in this one, probably I not enabled because like I was trying to record the screen, how it works, I'm trying to explain things. So these are videos what I have captured for uh, some of the new courses what I'm working on. So advanced bird focusing. So those things I will get, it will get updated at some point for the bird photography course. So for that, I have recorded all these videos, which I showed it to all of you. Okay, so there uh, in my regular scenario, what I do is I enable the IAF and then use this tracking. So once the camera is able to track or identify the bird eye, then even the focusing point becomes even more smaller and it just goes on the eye of the bird. And then it starts to track that. Okay, so that is how precise the autofocusing points is in Sony. And as I said, there is no one single answer. A lot of these options, it's important that you experiment it in the field. Okay, you need to experiment and use it in the field and then know as to when to use what kind of AF point. So I will not have a standard answer. It's all about understanding what each of the focusing points they do and then on what subjects, what we have to use so that you have to basically experiment in the field. Okay. How to record video also, sir, at the same time while we're taking the... Uh... No, no, that is totally outside the scope of this discussion, but... For that, you need an external recorder. You may have seen the kind of recording you need. Ninja V. Yeah, so Ninja V, Ninja V Plus. So it's an external recorder. So that you need to connect with HDMI and then simultaneously you can record still. In auto focusing sensitivity, I have some small doubts. So page number 19. Okay. Uh, it's uh, We need to keep standard or we need to keep locked one, sir. See, uh, if you keep it to log, what happens is sometimes suddenly if you want to shift the focus to a, sub, sub, a, a different subject suddenly, right, there may be a delay. So generally, like what I use is the standard one and standard has worked very well all this time. Thank you, sir. Okay. Other questions I have in apps, so you can see it. Uh... In yeah, mobile yeah. All those uh, generic questions which a lot of you have asked in the app. So I do have uh, those questions. I'll take it up at the end of the session. There are at least like eight to 10 to 15 questions which are coming. I will answer all of them separately. Thank you, sir. Okay, cool. Uh, any other queries on the autofocusing? So what I just showed you all folks, so all these things is there as a part of the photography learning path. So this is the place. So understanding focusing. So each of these various ones, if you go through it, the same thing I've already explained in detail in each of this chapter. So this is the one what you should be going through. Okay. Uh, Revati, yes, go ahead, ask about the doubt on uh, BBF, please. You can uh, unmute your mic and you can ask me here. Yeah, sir, can you hear me, sir? Uh, yes, I can. Yeah, good evening, sir. Uh, actually, uh, in the case of back button focusing, uh, what we do is when subject is moving, uh, we will be uh, placing that uh, autofocusing point on a subject. Yes. And then you will press the back button focusing. Correct. And then we used to uh, move the camera in case of autofocus continuous move, uh, if the subject is moving. So do we need to keep on press the back button yes. focusing or just 
pressing once and after focusing moving the camera will focus the subject sir so oh, so in case of okay so in case of back button what we'll have to do is like once you press this back button here right so you yes, press sir. this basically like wherever you want to focus on so you basically keep the focusing point on that and then you press so the moment you press this the camera will start focusing that okay if you leave this yes, the focusing is gone and then if you move the camera the focus it doesn't work okay so okay. if you're tracking the subject you have to keep it pressed continuously and then move it so wherever the camera basically like wherever the subject is moving so if you see the thumb it has to be pressed all the time and move and whichever you want to click then the finger it basically you click it here so both of them are used simultaneously in case of back button focusing so in case of mirrorless you don't use the concept of back button because that is achieved by the tracking functionality so the tracking a point what we have that takes care of continuously tracking the subject wherever it goes so you there is no concept of moving the auto focusing points none of those things applies to the tracking a points of sony canon and nikon okay so that is the power of the mirrorless so that is where the back button focusing generally doesn't have any role to play in case of mirrorless okay sir okay okay so thank you sir yeah. and uh, kalyan pan would nikon mirrorless come to the courses uh yes very soon in fact that is the reason i purchased that new uh, ninja v plus to record the screen so that uh, i can create some of these courses technical courses i can create it at a very fast pace so that is where i purchased it uh, otherwise like the concept used to be connect the camera to your tv screen and record the entire thing it's a tedious process basically for recording so i invested in that ninja v plus and uh, the mirrorless courses uh, it will be out uh, i would not say pretty soon because the whole month of march and april i'm extremely tied up with my courses with my uh, uh, wildlife workshops and the entire month of may i have kept it free but uh, if i am able to come up with something faster uh, in the month of uh, uh, february march itself then i should be able to do that okay but yes it is definitely in the pipeline the mirrorless for both canon and nikon it's in the pipeline and satish as i said the uh, bbf is definitely not recommended for mirrorless if you are using the tracking option okay cool uh, anybody else any other query superb sir ah oh. this is sagar here yes can sir. you just can yes. you just throw some light on focusing the eyes? as you just mentioned that bbf is not used for mirrorless okay so in my rfi i have kept i have allocated two buttons okay one for back button focusing that is for single point and one for uh, tracking okay okay uh, so what, what kind of what, uh, photography you do sagar do you do wildlife or any other birds okay. birds or oh, then if you are doing bird photography then you need to fully understand about the tracking one what i said use yeah. that and back button is not required for that okay but what generally i do sir one of the uh, button i have allocated for tracking okay okay so do i need to uh, press it continuously or uh, how it is yes if it is allocated for tracking then you have to keep it pressed yeah that is i am doing that is i am doing so yeah that's the right technique yes thank you sir okay good Okay. Uh, here is my other one. Not this. Okay. Uh, so the next topic was about high key and low key photography. Uh, now see this whole concept of high key and low key is uh, again. Uh, I think in the exposure part, I may have explained it. If it is not there, I'll make sure I will create a separate course for that. I've already made a list of all the individual courses what I have to create. Even I think the previous or the previous uh, webinar what we had. So in that we discussed about the various courses what I need to come up with the FAQ course things what I told about. Yeah, there you go. Uh, it's already mentioned here. So high key you can't see it here. So high key low key video shoot has to happen and then tip for the backlit photography that one. And then even the shooting technique, somebody has asked saying like, how do we get the subject in the viewfinder, especially birds in flight? What is the technique uh, which we have to use to get that bird in flight? So long lens shooting composition. So these things I've already made a note of it. So those FAQ videos, 
I hope to shoot it uh, hopefully in the March because March uh, specific month I am traveling to create more of this uh, content. So hopefully by that time uh, for that I should be able to cover the high key low key separately because high key and low key it's not just about exposure and uh, metering how to expose it but also like we have to go into the depth of like the processing so that will complete the high key and low key but in simple terms if i have to explain in in fact uh, recently i it is there in my uh, instagram account uh, under highlights where i've explained how to create the low key images now the concept of low key images you need to choose the subject on which there is spotlight falling, just the light, sunlight, or any source of light falling just on the subject. The background has to be in the shadow area. So if the background is in shadow area, and then just on the subject, the light is there. Since the camera cannot handle the dynamic range of the very bright area and the shadow area, one of it will be compromised for exposure, and we compromise the background. So we get the exposure on the subject where there is bright light. So if it is in evaluative or matrix or multi-segment metering, so then we underexpose by at least two stops. So minus two stops we underexpose so that the background goes even darker and we get a proper exposure on the subject. So that is the concept of low key photography. High key is the opposite of that, where the background we choose overcast cloud. So anything which is more of bright area, and no direct sunlight is used in case of high key image. So high key is generally done in overcast situations where the background is overcast, cloudy situation, and the subject is in the front. So here, if you understand the concept of exposure, because it takes the oral value, the background will be underexposed or subject will get underexposed. To get proper exposure on the subject, we overexpose by at least plus two plus two one third or plus two two thirds stop we overexpose the background goes completely white and we get proper exposure on the subject so quickly i may have something okay i'm not sharing the screen again i'm sorry uh share the whole screen from some of my very old uh, fb teaching okay photography as all files it's not here let's see if it's there in my other folder okay fp teaching okay there you go uh high key yeah see here so this is the concept this is if you see here okay uh, it, uh it's in the cloud okay you see this image now so this is the concept of high key where I shoot against the white overcast sky and then I get a proper exposure and then in post processing I work on the contrast levels everything to get really good colors on the subject the background is completely overexposed so again I use the levels to overexpose the background and this is how I get the high key image opposite of that is the low key these are all the low key image examples this one so even this one, if you see, so these are all, if you see, there is just direct sunlight falling only on the subject. Backdrop is in the dark shadow area. It's there. I mean, there is subject, there are things over there, but because of the dynamic range, the camera cannot handle exposure of bright area and dark area in the same frame. And that is where the background gets underexposed. So this is the low key. So this is the concept of high key and low key here in a single frame, I think both have uh, shared hold on this is still downloading yep downloaded okay it's in the back here yeah so this is left is a low key image right side is a high key so underexposed by minus two stop for the left image overexposed by plus two for the right image and then further fine tuning of that you have to do in case of post processing Okay, it's just a simple technique of exposure. That is what the high key and low key is. Cool. Any questions on high key and low key? Uh, sir, Rashmi here. Uh, 
why shooting on high key and low key when you said uh, it should be one stop minus uh, the exposure right. sorry for the low key so so wouldn't mm -hmm. even the subject go uh, uh, like the camera will uh, it it won't so do that what will happen what will happen in case of that let me see if i have uh, there was behavior i'm just shooting if i have the answer for you right here yeah this is the one we saw oops okay uh here i don't have uh hold on give me one second Unfortunately, I don't have it here. Videos. No, uh, because I just a uh, few days back, I shot a video to explain that. Okay, so uh, to give a straightforward answer to your question, uh, what happens is like when there is a spotlight just on the subject, okay, that area gets heavily overexposed. Okay, okay. and then the background will be normal. So you'll be able to see all the details, everything in the background. But whereas just the subject becomes severely overexposed, trying to see if they can recreate its stuff. Okay, so that is where to get a proper exposure on the subject, we underexpose it so that overexposed subject that basically comes to normal exposure, and then the background okay. will become very dark. So everything goes okay. down by minus two stops. But for that, the subject has to be exposed, like the for the example, the sunlight falling on the subject has to be or oh, very much brighter to absolutely that, that is why i use the terminology spotlight so subject okay. has to be in bright light and the background has to be in shadow area so that is what we call as the concept of spotlight uh yes kalyanpur anand if you are using spotlight uh, sorry spot metering then your exposure compensation will be different so chances are if you are using spot metering directly on the subject then you may not have to underexpose so much and this kind of a shooting is basically uh, like comfortable in aperture mode. Uh, see, once you understand how to shoot in aperture priority or uh, shutter priority or even complete manual, then honestly, like any of that uh, metering mode will work. But yes, simple answer again. Because in manual, because in manual, uh, like uh, the uh, uh, what do you see the exposing meter? We cannot. We are not able to control it. So uh, you can Loki. control it by varying any of the parameters of like ISO or aperture of shutter okay. speed. Okay, huh. that you is in the but all right, thank you. Yeah. Sir, uh, but in, uh, when we use spot metering, what I've observed is that if the bird has a set of different colors, so if you take the uh, center point on the different colors, the exposure also changes. Absolutely. So it yeah. kind of becomes risky to use. So can we shift, uh, like, is it it's uh, preferable to use evaluative, right? Absolutely. And then under exposed. So in fact, in the, the basics and, uh, yeah, basics and advanced fundamental photography, again, there, if you go, so there I've explained each of it in detail with examples, when to use what kind of metering and why. So that part, again, I have explained it in detail in the basics and advanced fundamentals of photography, a separate chapter on metering is there. There uh, in the classroom also, I explained the concept and then in the field also with practical example, I've explained how spot works, how evaluative works. So with examples, everything is there. So I would encourage you all to go through that particular chapter within that course. Okay. Okay, so yeah. Thank uh, so that is answered. No other queries here. Okay, uh, any other queries on the high key and low key? Okay, superb. Uh, next is, yes. See, handled low light photography. Again, uh, Handle low light photography. Let me quickly help you. Okay. 
So again, if you go into see all my courses, so the basics and advanced fundamentals of photography. So if you go into this particular course, haha, that's a old Sudhir, nice. Okay, so if you come down here, see here, practical low light photography using the theory of reciprocity, understanding the theory of reciprocity. Okay, so why I use aperture priority and then the practical. So if you see these ones, right, low light photography using the, reci the reciprocity theory. <coughs> so six, seven, eight, and nine, all of them explain about the low light photography. So how do we do what kind of techniques we use for low light photography? How do we arrive at the correct exposure for low light photography? So all those things are explained in this 7, 8, 9, 10, okay? Or rather 7, 8, 9. So this is something what I would encourage you all to go through to understand more about low light photography. Because for this, the most important thing is understanding the theory of reciprocity how each of the values they vary and of course the shooting technique also comes into picture if you are doing handheld photography then shooting technique comes into picture which is again explained as a part of the wildlife course in the same course again handheld shooting monopod shooting tripod shooting how to do everything is clearly explained so that is again a chapter what i would encourage you all to go through okay okay so what I'll do is like, uh, there were a lot of other uh, generic questions which had come in. So quickly, let me run through them. And after that, I'm going to open up for the general Q&A. Okay, so Anjan had uh, asked saying, I have a question for Tamron 150 600G2, which VC mode is suitable for which type of photography? Okay, now be it VC or AS or OSS or uh, what is Sony? Sony is OSS, OC, optical uh, stabilization uh oss yeah our sony is oss so irrespective of all these things right you have to understand generally in all these cameras or all these lenses the mode one is generally used for completely static subject okay so if the if the subject is static not moving at all then the mode one of the is vr vc is used which is meant for static subject Mode two is more for panning. So if the subject is moving and you're tracking the subject while it is moving, for that, the IS or the VR mode two has to be used. Okay, so in both mode one and mode two, what happens, your IS, VR or OSS is always active. So the moment you press the shutter release button, when you're focusing, you're tracking, you're still not clicked, the VC or the IS gets engaged. So it gets turned on. So whereas there is also an option called mode three in some of the latest lenses. So mode three, what it does is it will not activate your VR or IS. It will activate it only when you completely click the shutter release button. Okay. So that is where the mode three is used. And generally mode three people use it. Yeah. So generally mode three people use it uh, when they're on a tripod for proper composition because sometimes in mode one or two, like when that IS or VR is active, there's a small shake which comes into the viewfinder because of the activation. And a lot of people for composition, they don't like it. So for them, they generally use the mode three. Okay. So, but my use is always mode two is what I use. Okay. Hi, sir. Thanks oh, a lot there. for addressing. So, sorry. Thanks a lot, sir, for addressing. Okay. Sure, Anjan. Because and, mode three also. Uh, mode three also you can use, but in my case, I generally use mode two. Okay. 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 Mode Thanks. two is sorry. Mode three is the same as mode two, but it gets activated only when you press the shutter release button. Okay. okay. Uh, question from uh, Samir Bhatt is: Please consider include autofocusing for birds in flight for DSL users. Uh, yes. So that complete autofocusing points when to use what? So that I already explained. And as I said, uh, for DSLR users, go back and for Canon Nikon, that particular wildlife course, what I said, those chapters you see, there I have explained everything in detail again about when to use what focusing points and for what purpose. 
Uh, second question is how to conserve natural colors in the images of birds. Uh, so Samir, like when we talk about conserving the natural colors of images, your white balance comes into picture, your exposure triangle parameter comes into picture, your post-processing comes into picture, okay? So unfortunately, there is nothing called as the perfect color. So the color of the subject, what you are trying to shoot, purely depends on the camera settings, what you put, right? From, as I said, the white balance, the exposure triangle parameters that combined with your post-processing skills. So all three of them come together to get you the colors what you want. So there is nothing called the camera will decide everything and you get perfect colors that never happens. So if you want to get correct colors in your birds, then make sure you play around with white balance, proper exposure, come back in post-processing, again, make the corrections to get the kind of colors what you would have seen out there, okay? So that is the only way to get the correct colors. And uh, Samir, you had asked about Loki and Haiki, uh, and which was addressed in this. So the next question is from Arun. Uh, question, the first one is, okay, shooting technique and autofocus mode. If the bird or the subject is behind the branches, distractions, we wish to focus on the subject. Okay, so in this particular case, Arun, uh, so especially if you're using Canon lens, uh, sorry, Canon camera, so you have the spot AF. So if the subject is behind distraction, then there is the one spot, the spot AF, which is the very first autofocusing point in case of Canon. So that is the autofocusing point you have to use. And in case of uh, Sony, I already showed you the small autofocusing point. That is what you have to use. If the area is very small, it goes through that it will focus on the subject. And the same single spot is available in Canon, in, <coughs> sorry, in Nikon. So the single point is available in Nikon. That is what you have to use for Nikon. So I'm not sure which uh, camera body you have, but if the subject is behind branches distractions, this is the particular autofocusing point which you have to use. Your second question was, uh, camera setting to shoot against uh, the sun to get golden bouquet. Again, uh, for this, a simple answer is like, uh, you may have to do an underexposure of minus one or minus two, depending on like how bright the sunrise sunset is. Uh, otherwise, the correct way to do is, is understand about exposure in depth, understand about metering in depth. As per the photography learning course, you'll have to go back to that because you have to understand everything about metering and then you will come to know what is underexposure, what is overexposure, different metering, you'll understand that. Then you will arrive at what is the correct setting. Again, as I said, there is no magic setting as to like what is the perfect camera setting to get the golden bouquet against the sun. There is no magic setting because it depends on the intensity of the sun. So once the sunset starts happening right from four o'clock onwards, again, depending on where you are, so you will have to use different camera settings. So no standard setting, unfortunately. It's more of understanding the concepts and then you have to arrive at the right setting. The third question was like, how to get details from overexposed part of the image? Uh, unfortunately, yes, even in my post-processing, I've shown you where you used the, the shadow highlighter, you can shadow slider, you can use to get details in the shadow area. And the same way opposite, the highlight slider is there for the raw file processing. So if you reduce the highlight slider all the way down, chances are you may recover details in the overexposed area. So there are two ways to recover. One is the exposure slider itself, you underexpose it. Hopefully if the camera still has retained the data, it will give you the exposure properly in the overexposed areas. So use the slider to underexpose. And the second sub step of that is use the highlight slider to take it all the way back to get details in the overexposed area. Otherwise, if original data is not captured and the overall image is completely overexposed, unfortunately, nothing can be done. Question from Rasmi. Uh, it's about composition. So how to create composition of a bushy branches with leaves or less leaves or without leaf? Okay. Uh, so here, uh, Rashmi, it's very difficult to answer this because it purely depends on how exactly you're trying to define this. So for this particular one, what I would recommend, Rashmi, is, uh, okay, if I'm not wrong, I think this particular image you have already put it for the critic section. Uh, there are at least three or four images pending from my side to review. 
if i remember this is one of the images what you have put for the critic there in detail since i have the image an example so i'm going to like explain in detail as a part of that video okay so just hold on to that as i said there are three or four videos i need to do critic on so tomorrow i should be able to address so that will get addressed there so second one is uh, again how to avoid distraction created by urbanization uh, unfortunately you cannot so that is where you include them in your composition so it all depends on how you compose the framing so background distraction if there are buildings other things so you can show that as urban wildlife and be creative in your composition and include those buildings in the in the background with the foreground subject to show about the urbanization and also the urban wildlife otherwise if they become a little bit out of focus with some horizontal lines out of focus lines running across they become distractions and chances are you will not be able to make good images next one is from uh, king shikpauri any chance of data loss damage of putting the ssd such this airport baggage scanners uh, no nothing happens so all the time the uh, hard disk goes through the airport scanners nothing happens so you don't have to worry about that okay and the next question from neeraj uh, about uh, the quality of auto focusing when you use a third party adapter with a mirrorless uh, camera uh, it's not only for uh, nikon it's for anybody the moment you use an adapter auto focusing takes a hit okay so that is where it is very important to use the native lenses in fact even with respect to canon the Canon 400mm, 600mm RF lenses, what they have, they are not fully RF lenses. They are the original EF lenses, but they have put the RF adapter to that. They have just plugged into it and selling the whole piece as an RF lens, which is not a pure RF lens. A proper RF lens is the 100-500 or the 600-800, whatever F11, F16 lens. So that is a pure, proper RF lens. So my recommendation is, avoid using any of these third party adapters because it will take a hit with respect to auto focusing something you can't avoid and manoj i think most of your questions have answered let me see uh, we can take an auto white balance see uh, as i keep saying manoj white balance camera settings everything it's always recommended to get it right in the field the first time okay so that is where my recommendation is always to use manual white balance and get the correct white balance in the field. <clears throat> and uh, if you suddenly change your mode from uh, still photography to video photography, then in your cameras, you have to see what kind of settings you have put for video photography. So the exposure will be totally different. Whatever settings you have put for uh, your still, you cannot expect to use the same setting for video. There are two separate entities the exposure the settings are two different things even in the menu option if you go for still it is different for video it is different so it is two different settings you cannot use the same setting for both of them so you need to understand that and then work on that uh, below 4k tripods i'm really sorry you definitely will not get good quality tripods you are using a sony a1 with a 200 600 lens you have invested more than like five to six lakhs and when you invested up to six lakhs on your equipment so please please invest uh, on a good tripod like don't uh, sorry, sorry for interruption sorry sorry for interruption uh -huh. uh, given uh, not 4k sir they are uh, typing wrong sir it's 60k they are asking sir no you Without, don't have to uh, 60K. Uh, see it's very simple get on to Manfrotto website, get on to Gitso website. Okay, so for the kind of budget you're talking, Gitsos, they're very expensive. Go to Manfrotto. In Manfrotto, look for the tripods. The basic, basic requirement of already explained, three times the weight of your equipment it should support. So go ahead, look for any of those tripods which does not have a center column, check the budget, and then you have to go. Okay, so that is the only way you will have to arrive at the correct tripod for your equipment okay thank you uh camera lens coat is something which i would recommend uh because one is it protects the lens from getting damaged and second is in bright light when you're do, doing bird photography wildlife photography it reflects a lot of light the white color so generally to suppress that again we use the camouflage or the lens coat so yeah i mean like whether it is a good thing to have 
for wildlife, I would recommend, definitely recommend the using the lens coat. Okay, cool. So these were all the offline questions which had come in as a part of the chat. And Manish has some questions here. Uh, which post-processing software is better to use and which are the software available for PP? Uh, so Manish, like if you go through the post-processing course, uh, there, my recommendation is to use the Adobe set of tools. So Adobe plus basically I use uh, Photoshop, Adobe Camera Raw plus Photoshop and then the neat image. So these are all the various tools I use for post-processing. So which are all the software available for post-processing? So if you go through that particular course, even in the explanation I already mentioned, like what are all the prerequisites, what kind of software you will need for the post-processing, okay? So as I said, my recommendation is Adobe Camera Raw, Photoshop, Neat Image. So th those are the various tools I use for post-processing. And of course, you are welcome to use Lightroom as well. Okay. Yeah. So folks, so these were all the various queries, questions which had come in. So what I'll do is at this point, let me stop the recording because like general discussion which happens, I don't want to record because that may be specific to what you're going to ask. Because this video, I'm going to upload it in YouTube and it will not be a public YouTube. It will be a private uh, one where I'm going to send you the link, which you can see. It. Okay. So let me at this point, just stop the recording and then we can continue. Uh, okay. So, all right. Uh, so just to, for the recording purpose, I'll say thank you all, but it's not the end of the session. So folks, thanks for joining. And uh, I'm going to end the recording now and we'll, but question answers will continue. Thank you.